Okay, so um, thanks to everyone um, for coming uh, to this panel artist talk um, for Women, Art and Technology, which is currently up at the Fort Worth uh, Community Center. Um, so just to give people a uh, kind of um, an idea of how this talk is going to go in terms of the timeline. Um, for five minutes approximately, I'm going to give an introduction um, of the show um, of all the artists and also the moderator. So um, if you hear that I'm introducing you, um, please just say hello. Um, so people know like basically, you know, who you are. Um, that would be great. Um, then we have about 35 minutes for each artist to give kind of a five minute presentation. Um, you know, about kind of your work and how it relates to technology. Uh, for 20 minutes, we have um, Elizabeth, uh, who is a doctor. doctor. Okay, that was, <laughs> that, that was a little bit. Okay, that was the extension. <laughs> scary. <laughs> scary, it was scary. Um, so we have Eliz uh, Dr. Ranieri, Dr. Elizabeth Ranieri, who is the, going to be the moderator, and she's going to post some questions to the artists, and we're going to have a discussion. Um, and then we have 15 minutes for questions from um, the audience or the, uh, the students as well. Um, and we have an extra 15 minutes just in case if we do go over with any of the presentations, okay? Um, any kind of questions at all from anybody? No? Okay. Okay, so I'm going to start um, just by sharing my screen here. Okay. Okay, I just wanna, this may be in the way, kind of. Okay, um, so this is a show that I have organized at the Fort Worth Community Arts Center, um, which is running from November 9th, um, sorry, not November 9th, actually. Um, I believe it is November 5th to about December uh, 12th. Um, so this uh, show is actually, um, has seven um, women artists uh, who work with technology um, in their work in some sort of way, okay? Um, so this is not just a ceramic show. Um, it is across kind of all medias. It's a, it's a mixed media show. Um, so part of the um, impetus for this show was to um, really showcase um, different female artists and how they use technology basically to talk about um, the things that they were important um, to them and that they wanted to express, um, especially because technology is more um, kind of widely seen as something that um, is within kind of the male realm of kind of creativity as well, okay? Um, so if I could go to the next, I don't know why I can't go to the next slide here. Oh, okay. So this is a picture of the Fort Worth Arts Community Center, um, which is kind of in the museum district of Fort Worth, if anyone has been there. Um, it's uh, next to kind of the Ammon Carter, um, the modern and kind of the Kimball around that area. Um, but if people are not familiar with that center, um, they actually showcase a lot of um, community artists um, within kind of the vicinity or kind of the local states. Um, so you can apply uh, to be, you know, the show there of your own or kind of a group show. So here's just a couple of shots. We did have our opening um, last Friday, thanks to all the artists for coming from far, far away to kind of install the work as well. Okay. Okay. So um, I'm just going to go through uh, some of the introductions now. Um, so just a brief introduction about myself. Um, so I'm currently an assistant professor of ceramics at the University of North Texas. Um, and I obviously I teach in the Department of Studio Art. Um, I do work with digital processes to create ceramic objects and installations. So next, I'd like to introduce um, Dr. Elizabeth uh, Ranieri. Um, so Dr. Elizabeth Ranieri teaches courses in the history of art and craft in the art history department in CVAD and also will serve as our moderator during the Q&A period. Did you wanna just say hi? Oh. Hello. <laughs> hi, okay. Um, next we have uh, Mary A. Johnson. Um, and she is currently teaching as a lecturer in the foundations program at CVAD. She has shown her work uh, globally, including uh, in the New York Hall of Science, the Nair Kravstra Library in Moscow, and multiple art centers and museums in China. Hi, everybody. Okay. Um, next, we have uh, Liz Trosper. So she is an artist educator based in Dallas. She is currently an assistant professor of instruction 
in the School of Arts, Technology, and Emerging Communication at the University of Texas at Dallas. Her artwork is represented by the Barry Whistler Gallery in Dallas and was recently included in a survey of, abstra uh, of abstraction at the San Antonio Museum of Art. Hey, everyone. Great. Okay, so um, next is Julie Lieberstadt. Um, so she is currently an assistant professor of art design and technology at Texas Women's University in Denton, Texas. Her interactive video installations and digitally fabricated sculptures have been exhibited in many venues, including at Women and Their Work Gallery in Austin, Texas, and Museo de la Curidad in Mexico. Oh, Julie, do you want to say hi? Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Hi. Hello. Looking for my mute. Great. Okay. So next we have Naomi Peterson, um, who some of you are, let's find her here on the list. Oh, there she is. Um, so Naomi Peterson creates hand-built ceramic objects to inspire intentionality and that highlight the importance of the human condition. She is currently a resident artist at the Houston Center for Contemporary Craft and a recent MFA graduate of um, CVAD. Hello. Okay, um, next is uh, Jihei Han, um, and she's a ceramic artist uh, currently based in Helena, Montana. She has previously been the recipient of the Clay Houston BIPOC Award, um, and Nsika Multicultural Fellowship, and also a finalist in the CAD Contemporary Art Dealers of Dallas Fund. Good morning. Hi. And then last we have uh, Lara Assam. So Lara um, is a recent MFA graduate from the Metals Program at CVAD and is currently based in El Paso, Texas. Um, Assam's studio practice focuses on combining metalsmith textile and digital fabrication techniques. Hello, everyone. Oh. Great. Okay. Oh, wow. So um, I think I'm going to, uh, I'm going to stop share here. Um, and we can get started with the artist presentations. Um, and if people don't mind, um, maybe I will um, start with Mary and just go down the list of the introductions. Um, and then I, I can maybe go last after everybody and then I'll hand it over to Elizabeth um, afterwards. Okay, um, so first um, we have Mary Johnson. Um, did you want to share your screen? Yeah, I probably will. Yep. Um, so first, I, I guess I should, for those of you that haven't been to the exhibition, kind of describe really quickly what you'll see in that corner from, from my studio. Um, you'll see three different sets of things. Um, on the left, you'll see a couple of photographs. In the middle, you'll see um, some paper-based works. And then just around the corner, you'll see a video. And um, the, the work is placed like that because one, one part of my studio practice kind of leads into the next. Um, so I thought I would just spend a couple minutes kind of describing my process um, and a little bit of a focus on technology because I use, um, I kind of bridge between using tech and also using kind of, kind of fine craft processes as well. Um, so just to give you kind of a general understanding of how I create my work, I start usually by kind of setting up tablescapes. Some people might call them still lives, but they're, they're kind of like this landscape that takes place across the table um, in my studio. And then um, I take a lot of photographs um, of, of this um, as well as some video. And then the work kind of happens from there. So um, I was really happy for the opportunity. Thank you, Lisa, for organizing this because it's the, I think, it's one of the first times or one of the only, there's just maybe a couple other times that I've shown the photographs individually. Um, I don't usually show them. I have some images on my website that I'm gonna show you, but usually I, I show the paper-based work or the video work or a digital collage that is a result of those photographs. Um, but what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you a few of those and um, I'm going to show you a couple videos of table, tablescapes kind of give you understanding of what I'm working with here in the studio. And then I have a short video that describes my process for the video piece, because that I think is, there's digital things happening in the paper-based work, 
Um, I take those photographs um, that are digital and sometimes I alter them, sometimes I leave them alone and then they're used in hand collage and that paper-based work. Um, but the video piece is digital collage that's been animated. Um, if we have issues hearing the video, then I'll kind of pause it and give you a quick summary to move through it. So hopefully we don't have any issues, but let's see here. You'll have to excuse my very messy desktop. <laughs> so my, my studio, including my desktop, is still kind of a hot mess um, from the exhibition. I don't know if this happens to anybody else, but things sort of devolve in the studio and on my desktop, and then I go through a cleanup process. I'm not at the cleanup stage yet. So these photographs um, are from um, the tab one particular tablescape that I set up um, and use the images from. The Im these images were used um, in a digital vinyl collage for an installation in Shanghai, but I've also created a video piece from it that will be um, in an exhibition in December in South Korea. Um, that should give you a general understanding of what I'm doing. These are um, the images that are actually used for the work that's on show right now at Women, Art, and Technology, as well as a couple other pieces. So these actually, these are the two photographs that are shown there in their uh, holes, in their whole state. But there are a lot of images that come from, from this particular still life or tablescape. There's a few older pieces here. I do, like I said, work digitally with the pieces sometimes, I play around. So um, what I wanna do now is show you a video, of, a couple of videos of the These are completely unedited, this video here. Um, so it's a bit choppy, but I wanna just sort of give you all like a very raw insight into my practice. So this particular um, tablescape, I brought in lots of bags of dirt, um, laid it across the table, lots of plants and some um, vegetable and material like melons and peaches. Um, and some, some leaves that I found around. And I don't think it's in this video, but there's one video where it's just some ants kind of moving through the piece. I didn't, they didn't intentionally bring them in. They just sort of came in with everything. And that was uh, really nice to, to see. This, one. this particular um, tablescape was maybe about eight feet long by about maybe three feet tall. And I think eventually I'll use these bits of video in something. I'm just not sure yet. And sometimes I do that. I'll gather lots and lots of documentation and kind of put it on the back burner to be used um, at a later point. So now I'm gonna show you a video with sound about three minutes and it's um speaking about that video that's right around the corner called heartthrob and let's hope the sound will work um elisa if it doesn't seem like it's working sound wise can you kind of alert me um through audio because i'm gonna well no i'll leave it like this um i was gonna put it in a full screen but if i put it like this then i can see you you can let me know if something's wrong with audio. Okay. We, we can hear it. I can hear it. Okay. okay. More experience reliably. A 
but my work emphasizes the most stable. The work finds itself in a stretch spot between what attracts us and what repulses us. What is organic and synthetic and what we see, what we think we see. In this place, you make your voices. Do you question your eyes or what your eyes are seeing? To begin my work, I create table landscapes and photograph them using the images in collage, along with organic dyes towards predominantly paper-based works. Much of my normal time in the studio is spent mixing, cutting, and gluing. My practice is a combination of construction and alchemy. My recent relocation to the US, however, left me without a studio space for a time, and so I turned to video. To begin in an unfamiliar medium, I returned to a previous installation, Tower of Babel. This work utilized tissue pen leaves of rice paper colored with vegetable matter, such as purple cabbage, black rice, logwood, further altered with the addition of minerals and heat. These leaves were heavily layered over a framework of digital collages created from photographs of a tablescape constructed solely for the installation. The fragility of the leaves allowed them to shiver and wave as the wind came across the tower. I reapproached these digital collages with an intent to affect motion in the video and heartthrob as well, without using my accustomed materials. Layering them one upon another, I created an animation of an entity whose slight digital motions echo the organic, the pulse of a heartbeat, the schedule of the tides, the turn of the earth, or the growth and collapse of a blossom. So this is just one of those digital collages that were used um, first printed on uh, a foam board for that uh, Tower of Babel installation. And then I took them and led them using After Effects. Um, and I want to I mean, I want to thank Liz Trosper, who gave me a lot of um, tips using After Effects when putting this together. Um, she's an expert. Um, and, and they were layered together to take the animation. Um, the one thing I'm not talking about is the is the kind of the conceptual place that the Valentines as paper-based pieces are coming from. I don't know, maybe Dr. Ranieri might ask me about that. I'm not sure, but um, even if she doesn't, that's that's fine. Um, but I'd be happy to, to talk about that uh, if anybody has any questions later. It's also about this uh, kind of transition um, that I made through kind of repatriation. Thanks. Thank you, Lisa. Great. Thank you. Um, so we have next actually uh, Liz Trosper. Um, so anytime you're ready. Yeah, I usually present on Teams. So just uh, figuring out where to share my screen for the moment. Let me move you over to this window so you don't have to see yourself again. <laughs> okay, here we go. Um, so I'm going to share my second desktop here. Yeah. Um, so yeah. you can do it. Well, um, 
it's going to make me quit Zoom and I'll uh, be right back. I'm sorry, it's not going to let me, uh, the video record me. So I'll be right back. Okay. Um, Would you like so I think we can just uh, move on to uh, the next person and then we can come back to Liz a little later on. So um, Julie, do you want to go uh, next? Happy to. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Great, and you can see my screen? Yeah, yeah. so um, Liz, I know you, I think you're back in here. Yes, um, I'm back. Um, so I just uh, asked actually, um, if it's okay if Julie sure. um, could just go first, just to give you a bit of time, so great. Yeah, yeah. Hi everybody, so I just wanted to um, thank uh, you for being here and I'm really grateful for the opportunity to show with all of these amazing artists. Um, and I'm actually an alum of UNT as well. So I got an MFA in new media and a MA in art education at the same time and um, then was hired at GW Raptor. So in my, um, as an artist, my work, I'm investigating our relationship with the built environment using themes of navigation, narrative cartography and disorientation. I use technology to make immersive participatory and interactive environments that engage viewers in observing the ways in which space is socially and culturally produced. So this video uh, installation was at Women in Their Work Gallery in Austin, Texas, and um, it is both physical and digital um, simulation of a fictitious mall that is eight-sided with, <laughs> with a complicated maze-like parking lot. And so the piece on the left is laser cut for mica. It's about seven feet square. And this uh, piece was also technically like a sort of technical challenge going from a two-dimensional plane to a three-dimensional digitally rendered environment. So the laser cut pieces are formica and then sort of fit together like a jigsaw puzzle. And on the right, there's two video stills of um, <laughs> the digitally rendered mall that is like a drive through, like a first person shooter perspective. And then on the top, like a helicopter God's eye view perspective. <laughs> um, and so this piece is sort of ever evolving. Um, I also wanted to share uh, this public artwork, which was um, a really long engagement for me in 2019 uh, in Boston with the Rose Fitzgerald Kennedy Greenway Conservancy. So this uh, project commemorated the um, anniversary of the Big Dig, which is the largest infrastructure project and most expensive. <laughs> um, and so, um, a highway was converted into a tunnel. And so I was sort of um, in a show related to the topic of, of cars and automobiles. So I got to work with some really great fabricators that use a lot of uh, digital fabrication in their studio. Um, they're named Jaywalk Studios. So we actually CNC milled the internal parts for the rotating, um, each of these signs is sort of like a rotating component and, and interacts with the wind. And then um, these are water jet cut metal, aluminum and um, vinyl cut pieces and um, a little 3D printed internal part as well. <laughs> and so these are sort of uh, reflective of this concept of sort of getting lost and using disorientation to kind of like have a greater sense perception in our urban spaces and um, kind of asks people to stop and also ask like larger philosophical questions about orientation in the world. Um, this is another more recent project. This was in um, 2020 during the lockdown and this was a parking garage a group show. And so it was like a drive-through parking garage to allow people to still experience art during the, during the pandemic. And so this was a project um, from Aurora Expanded, which everybody should check out in Dallas. They're a great organization that works with new media artists and uh, aimed at bringing it into public spaces. So um, my piece was a sort of infinite looping highway, sort of constantly turning. 
And the, this parking lot has a giant spiral exit. So I was sort of playing off the building itself. And I was very excited to play with actual cars as viewing perspectives. Um, I wired all of these lights. That was sort of the big new thing that I learned with this installation. Um, and then um, I wanted to show a little bit of my sort of work that I started in grad school at UNT. I used to work as the Fab Lab uh, student, student tech. <laughs> And I, I was I moved through two different iterations of the Fab Lab at UNT. Um, it's there in the beginning. <laughs> and so I, I made these there. And these are CNC milled um, Corian, which is like an artificial form of marble, marble dust and resin. And then they the sort of internal sculptural elements are resin prints from the form lab and uh, painted and then glass stones. And so these were sort of playing off of like idealizing sort of ubiquitous landscapes. And I do a lot of research into like, uh, you know, big box store parking lot patterns. <laughs> um, and then I have some of the work that is in our show in Fort Worth. So um, on the left and right are laser etched acrylic highway uh, junctions. And so, kind of really fascinated by the uh, computer aided design and how it impacts our, our everyday landscape and sort of creates a ubiquitous um, placelessness, placelessness where we're sort of interacting with um, suburban spaces that are identical all over the country. And also interested in like the history of highways, um, the design and, and construction of highways that displaced communities of color. So it's, I sort of think of like safety uh, symbols as a sort of like, I use them as a representation of kind of alarm and like uh, questioning safety of all kinds of bodies in public space. I think for women, we are constantly challenged to care for our own safety and, and it is often in peril um, as well as sort of intersectional and differently abled bodies. So, um, but this is a soft barrier. Um, I laser cut all of the fabric um, and constructed it with a sewing machine. So this was a little bit of a return to my roots. Um, my grandmother who was a quilter will be very <laughs> proud of this. Um, yeah, so I think that's all. And I just wanted to share if anybody wants to get in touch. Great, thank you. That was, that was great. Okay, <laughs> so I'm clapping on this side. Um, so next we have uh, Naomi Peterson. Did you want um, Liz to go next? Oh, sorry. Liz? Do you want to go next or? I'm, I'm happy to go ahead and go, um, oh, but yeah. Naomi, I don't okay. want to jump in front of you, but uh, sure. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Okay, here we go. Um, so I'm going to move you again so you don't have to see yourself. I hate when I do that. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you for your patience uh, earlier. Um, and I'm just going to talk about the work that's in the show. I'm so excited to... Um, be in the show and to have this opportunity. This has been a crazy semester of teaching for me. So I'm going to um, just um, revel in the opportunity to focus on research uh, for today. Um, and I scripted myself because you can probably already tell that I um, like to ramble. Okay, can everyone see my screen? Good, thank you. Okay, so my name is Liz Trosper. I focus on um, digital painting, uh, new approaches to the discourse. Um, uh, subject matter ranges, but I do tend to focus on the disappearing, uh, ephemera, things that um, end up in the trash, <laughs> femininity and um, literature. So um, I'm really uh, excited about this particular piece. This is the earliest work in the show. It's called Representational Painting. And I'm just gonna show a couple of stills from this video as I talk through sort of the thought process behind this piece. 
Um, the piece is durational in nature. And I created a set in my studio uh, and filmed myself uh, once a day, every day for 30 days as um, I performed my maquillage. Um, so uh, applying makeup to my face. And it's an homage, um, it's a derivative work, um, paying, um, paying respects to um, the uh, 1971 38 minute black and white silent film by the artist Eleanor Anton. Um, and it, um, she's a genius. Um, and I like to look at the works um, of artists that I feel are dealing with topics that are incredibly uh, prescient and uh, maybe uh, reflect on the fact that many of the things that we think of um, as specific to things like social media and new media actually have roots um, in uh, culture um, rather than technology. So uh, this piece is really trying to resituate the idea um, and sort story about self-presentation in a new way. Um, and so this is actually a screenshot uh, toward the end at the 15 minute mark um, of the video, but I want to go back a bit um, and let's see if I can go back a bit. Um, and uh, this was my way of doing that. Um, it's about the skills and imagery around the act of maquillage, um, that the labor is repetitive, um, that it's meant to disappear, and that it's typically associated, well, it's a associated with um, the feminine or female gender expression uh, in addition to female bodies. Um, and it's meant to represent self-presentation, but ultimately it obscures. So the layering that I did, and I did in After Effects, and you're welcome, Mary, um, uh, was meant to um, sort of reflect this Sisyphean repetitive process of a applying um, these layers um, and to make connection with the touchy dabby um, uh, nature of, uh, of painting. So, um, so this piece, um, the more that it layers up with each day that is layered footage and it's layered to run concurrently. So the zero, zero mark starts again every day and layers over it. And the types of uh, blending modes that I applied, um, the more that it stacks, the more it actually disappears the layers. So um, the, the footage actually becomes more clear the fewer layers there are. So now this is down to one, I guess, particularly long 15 minute session of applying makeup. And um, so earlier in the video, we have more layers, there's more white space that is disappeared. Um, and uh, this is really just meant to show um, the repetitive and obfuscational nature of maquillage. Um, and to say, hey, go watch the Eleanor Anton video. Um, this piece really um, relates to the same idea. It's called Untitled Palettes from 2020. Um, and it's a catalog of um, wax paper palettes that I use to create um, the skeins and tubular structures that you might be more familiar with, familiar with if you've seen my work before. Um, and uh, they refer to other works. So um, they're seemingly straightforward. It's um, screenshot presentations. Some are duplicated, um, and yet they refer to objects and works that you don't see. Um, so to me, it's sort of a way of referring to how uh, bureaucracies and um, structures, systems uh, are seemingly very straightforward and transparent um, and systematic, but there's always a negotiation between concealing and revealing that's at play. Um, this final piece, um, the last, I think is the most playful. Um, it's playing the game of what, of concealing and revealing. So this um, grid of QR codes is displayed on the wall. Um, and to me, it sort of forms uh, the essence of technological interaction, um, which is the negotiation between what you see and what you don't. Um, and uh, I think, Maybe I could ask you to go away um, when you leave this meeting or maybe do it now if you have dual screens, but simply hit command option U on one of your favorite um, websites um, and you'll find 
concealed world of poetry underneath the visuality of websites. Um, and that's how I code my own um, and code itself and the material difficulties that I encountered in the show, um, combined with being a teaching artist, actually represent some of the key failures um, that I think are essential to creative practice. Julie, I heard you mentioning sort of the new challenge that you take on with each show. Um, and uh, those dual failures represent some of the key learnings that I took away from the show, um, the material challenges uh, in working with vinyl. Um, and their prompts um, as I go forward and thinking about um, new approaches to digital painting that I want to um, incorporate for future works. Um, but I encourage you um, to sort of probe a bit deeper when you go and see these. Um, the codes are for scanning and, and this work um, uh, is experienced uh, entirely within the digital realm. Uh, but again, um, I hope that I've covered at least um, a bit about the um, concerns conceptual purchase to these works that you'll see in the show. And if you haven't seen it yet, I hope that you go. So thank you, everyone. Thank you. Great. So um, I'll hand it over to you, uh, Naomi. Thanks, Elisa. So um, I, I just wanted to preface by saying, um, you know, I'm Naomi. Hello. Um, I am traditionally, um, I'm traditionally trained in ceramics, primarily hand building, but I also do have a background in throwing. And so I find it uh, that informs a lot of the decisions that I make. Um, and uh, a lot of these I feel like I, I use clay, but I, um, because of the pandemic, uh, I've switched to different forms of making. So uh, I just wanted to preface that because I don't know if you can see behind me, but um, I am in my sort of mostly ceramic studio, but I do, um, I also incorporate other processes that you'll see. Okay, so. Yeah, so here's an image from my, my thesis show. Um, it's called Hugging. And um, I like to incorporate a lot of things that aren't traditionally sort of um, thought of when you think of technology. Um, I like to, I'm, I'm kind of exploring and meditating on interpersonal relationships. This piece is actually, um, a piece about my mom and I, um, during the pandemic, I, you know, like a lot of people at UNT and a lot of people uh, across the uh, United States, if not around the world, lost access to my grad studio. So um, I, but not only that, but I was, you know, we were all told we have to go back indoors, we have to like, be at home. And I don't know about you, but I am not, I was not a huge homebody before the pandemic. Um, I was a huge studio rat. I would stay there for 12 hours a day, every single day if I could. Um, and I really had this um, sort of epiphany of like, what am I doing? Like, I'm, I'm just working and I'm working and I'm working and I'm not comfortable. I'm not really kind of, I'm not making the work that I wanna make. I was, I was focusing on social drinking, which was really interesting to me um, and how we interact with other people through objects. But then I thought, what if objects can interact with each other? How can we like, you know, can I talk about process and material and, um, you know, have these objects relate to one another um, to kind of, you know, think on my own relationship. So uh, during this time I was um, knitting here, I'll go to this one first. Um, so I was knitting with my uh, my little knitting group that um, I helped form, and we knit over Zoom every Friday still. And I felt like you know this was really helping give me um, an outlet to create. Um, so I was you know this is kind of contextualizing this piece, which is in the show. Uh, it's called By Design. It's nylon, three D printed and uh, hand felted wool on the bottom. And another thing that was also giving me a little um, sort of an outlet to create and you know, helping me not to go crazy other than like playing Animal Crossing and video games. Um, I was taking a digital fabrication class with James Thurman and it wasn't, you know, it wasn't like, okay, you know, this is 3D printing 101. This is how you laser cut. This is how you do this and that. 
I was finding that um, a lot of the projects were okay, like, you know, you need to make make like a wearable using 3D printed processes. So this is what that was. And so I had to go out and figure out, okay, this is the tutorial that I need to do. This is like the process. I was interested in uh, knitting and I was finding a lot of connections between how knitting um, your layering stitches to create wearable garments. Um, and so with 3D printing, you're also using layers and time and process. Um, so I, I thought, you know, this is a great way to combine these things. Um, the little sort of bobbles on within the piece, um, within the earrings, are meant to be sort of like knots. Um, I uh, was really interested in this idea of like uh, mistakes, trying to figure out how I could make mistakes happen in the 3D print, but like make them look planned. Um, my mom calls these uh, sort of design, design decisions when it's in knitting. Um, so that's kind of the background uh, behind this piece. Um, I also feel it's really necessary to preface this because, you know, this, I feel like digital fabrication, I'm fairly, you know, still new to it. Um, but I'm using, I'm, I feel like I'm using it as a craft tool. Um, all the decisions that I'm, that I'm making are um, sort of craft based. Um, I'm really, I've been always interested in sort of craft theory, thing theory, if anyone's familiar with that, sort of the connections between objects, connections between things in our environment, very, very convoluted um, and very um, complicated. So I also, you know, this is like, I love that sort of thing, but my focus is to make it more approachable. Same, same way with technology. Um, I'm using 3D printing and digital fabrication, you know, laser cutting, things, I'm trying to work more intuitively. I'm wanting people to feel like these are objects that they can approach. So this piece, a swage, um, it's made up of a hand knit outer casing and a 3D printed uh, resin interior. And I'm finding these connections between um, the, again, the, the hand knit object and then the um, the 3D printed object, how the supports can kind of echo the stitches from the knitted object. And it can kind of create this anthropomorphized object in my mind where the knitted object is uh, sort of comforting the 3D printed object. And there's this sort of relationship. Um, this is another piece that's in the show uh, called Intro Related. Um, I'm thinking about the connections between um, the processes of like knitting and uh, things like hard and soft and what is a cup like what the heck like these these things that were that we use um, you know what what makes a cup so again like thing theory and um, and like you know thinking about the connections between and the subjectivity rather than the objectivity I know it sounds like really like sort of convoluted but um, you know, I'm thinking about how things are connected, how, you know, it's not just a cup, like what kind of cup, what, what is it made out of, not just how can it serve me. Um, and so this is kind of bringing me to what I'm focusing on now. Uh, I'm, I'm really, really interested in, in creating these wearables out of 3D prints, because what is more approachable than a wearable, things that you want to put on your body, that you want to touch, that uh, you want to have in this interaction with um, the, the things that we wear sort of help define us. So that's why I, I've been turning to wearables because it's a different kind of interaction than just a cup, a ceramic cup to the user. Uh, so um, in clay, I find that I want to dress up the material. I really want you to know that it is clay uh, and same with resin. 3D printed resin. I don't want to cover it up and make it seem like it's something it's not because I am really interested in that sort of showing the material, but like stretching its possibilities. And so that's why I kind of, I, I'm, my decisions of dipping a 3D printed resin print <laughs> into a two-part resin 
that's mixed with mica and then layering that on and showing this drippy sort of almost like sugary coated uh, outer layer creates that depth and structure that I'm really, I'm really trying to go for and trying to explore these ideas of, um, you know, my vernacular is kind of toys, edible, candy, softness. Um, I'm trying to make this approachable again. So, um, and so, yeah, here's some of my, uh, some of my information. If you'd like to uh, find me on the Instagrams or my website or my email. So thanks so much, y'all. Great, thank you. Okay. Um, so now we'll move on to uh, Jihei Han. Jihei? Hi. Hi. Yeah, so Helena time is different. So my brain is really foggy. So if I make mistake, please let me know or let me stop. And let me see, I will, I will share my screen. Okay, so my name is Jihye, and I think some people call me Han, some people call me Jihye, I think it doesn't matter for me. So yeah, and currently I live in Helena, Montana. It's really cold and that's why I'm wearing this hat. So yeah, don't look at me so weird, but it's so freaking cold, oh my God. So, <laughs> okay, so uh, for this piece, I always thinking about like, uh, like nomadic lifestyle and then home and asking question myself, uh, why am I keep moving and where is my home and what is meaning of home? So, uh, so you can see the older line and then cube like kind of box shape. So all abstract line describe distance and my experience between the east and west. Also box shape represent uh, house structure is an architecture and boundary between interior and exterior space to protect myself. So actually this piece was a world piece and then for this show I tried to uh, kind of I tried to make it kind of 3D shape like I tried to represent like kind of house shape. So I decided to make kind of cube shape and through this piece, I'm pro provocating a desire for memory and displacements with abstract abstraction and blur boundary by the using technology. So you can see this is how make that uh, work. So first image is I collect the old map and uh, highway and uh, airline. I don't know, sky map or something like that. I tried to all the image and then kind of combine all the line. And I trans I tried to transfer to illustrate illustrator to create uh, all the abstract shape. Look like map. Yeah, because I combine all the map. And I using a bisque fire, uh, like the the top image is bisque like ceramic piece and then the bottom was a wooden piece. So I was lay, lay, uh, I was using the laser cutter mainly. So when I using the laser cutter, I can see uh, stacking all the line and shape. So I feel like this process represented reputation and captured the moment like my journey and my story. So I think using laser cutter uh, is really important to represent my journey and my time. So those uh, work piece, those work piece, uh, I don't know you guys see, because I usually, when I was a graduate program, first year I drew, I, I, I drawing and painting a lot, but second year, third year, I tried to create really big construct like piece and the public art piece. So I think this is really unfamiliar for you guys, but personally, I really, really like to drawing and painting. So this uh, image is kind of, uh, I was thinking about relationship between myself and family and uh, time and space like home. So I want to introduce 
uh, decal process because uh, you guys can see there are so many decals, so underglade, transparency, luster decal, but uh, I think first, I don't know, you guys can see few different kind of decal because I did the hand painting using decal. So I try to really blending each other so you guys can see which one is decal and <laughs> drawing. But the top image and I using the um, pen tool to create to uh, drawing this image and then using the illustrator to put the color. So the right side War piece was broken for some reason, so I was so sad. But those all the donut is decal. So I think right now I I live in Helena in like which is like Archibre. So I think I using the O15 temperature, and then you guys can see the it like certain time I have to holding 30 minutes, but I think it depends, it depends on the like paper the temperature will be slightly different. So my friend, uh, she fired 08, 08, but I fire 015. So I feel like the decal paper is really important to decide which temperature. So like this, those two main characters is like I hand the painting and then the older donor was like decal and then the kind of rainbow thingy was on the glaze decal so i was really enjoyed to use decal and then uh combine kind of traditional hand painting and like techno using technology decal so yeah uh, also thank you for oh sorry Thank you for giving me this great opportunity and I was really enjoyed working with you guys. So maybe next time if I have another chance, I really want to work with you guys again. So thank you. Thank you. Okay, so we'll move on to um, Lara. Okay, hi everyone. Sorry. Let me share my screen. I'm gonna keep it mostly on uh i just took a video it is the shakiest you know hand done video but i thought i'd just mostly talk about um the sh work in the show and a little bit of the process behind it because my work is so process heavy um and it's very modular so this is the newest itineration of cascading thresholds uh, which this the original piece was only like 16 feet and now it has spawned and grown into 26 feet wrapping around a, a wall with um, uh, it's about nine feet tall and the bottom comes up to maybe about two and a half to three feet so it's a pretty big sprawling piece um, that does it deals a lot I'll just play the video again um, it deals a lot with um, how much is visible between layers um, oh no and it doesn't like me. I'm sorry, guys. Um, and dealing a lot with like visibility and uh, how much we actually perceive another person and how much we um, can interact and show of ourselves. So that's the general idea of this, um, as well as coding. So I thought I'd talk a little bit more about process, though, since it is a huge involved part of my piece. So um, my practice really just involves I start with one little tiny tile. Um, and it's usually based, uh, I pull it a lot from architectural because my family is very mixed and I come from a Palestinian um, Middle Eastern background. And so I pull a lot of references from there um, while my mother's family is more Christian. So it's, and growing up in a Catholic town um, where I live down the street from a very fancy uh, church in El Paso, I saw a lot of like iconography and imagery, but mostly I got into the patterning of architecture and things like that. So a lot of my process begins where I pull reference from a tile and then create a second um, uh, tile that is made up of components of the first tile. And this is a huge thing for me because I think I, I like to think of interconnectivity and tessellations between people and um, how we affect each other and parts of us grow out of another person. So I like to jokingly think of this is my father, the original, and this is me, the offshoot. Um, but oops, there you go. So um, as I told you guys, a lot of my process comes from laser etching and engraving onto 
um, plexiglass. Here's the Fab Lab, so you guys are familiar with it. And then hand painting a lot of the uh, plexi myself and inlaying it for color. Um, so I set up these giant boards, uh, spend four hours laser etching one side and then um, dealing with that. And then since I do like to work modular, I like everything to be um, pull apart and connect just because I think we're constantly rearranging ourselves in our own lives. So I like the adaptability of being able to um, take this piece and every time you see it, it's gonna be a different arrangement. So um, hopefully you guys check out this one and maybe saw the one in my thesis because now they're completely different pieces. But these, um, I 3D designed all the mounts to match the shapes of the pieces. So it's, um, and then laser etched the tubing too, um, which makes great rolling pins if you guys ever get into that with Lisa. Um, but so that's that's a backbone of my process. Is it always starts digital and then moves into this more um, uh, process where I'm doing a lot more analog. There we go. And then here's some of the installation shots. Thank you, Naomi, for taking these pictures. Um, and just getting into like how exactly this is. So it usually involves um, making sure everything's layered properly and that you can actually see and then hopefully not falling off a ladder and being terrified of that. Um, I'm sure everyone can agree with that. Um, but yeah, so it is just slotting and sliding everything into place to create these visible forms that cascade down. Um, and so that's the, the biggest piece in the show. But I also have been working a lot smaller and taking um, that first tile you guys see, um, modifying it and actually designing it for brooches and jewelry. And instead of playing with um, layers and perception is and taking the same piece and um, dealing with how we can be given the same part and then filling it in with different components of ourselves. And be, um, so taking those same things and instead showing a difference in uh, like being with color and pattern and coding that way. Um, and then just to show you guys some of the backbone of that process, I'm sure you guys will probably think this is ceramic, but it's surprisingly concrete. So also, please, I'm sorry about my cat. She's very angry. I was gone for a week. Um, so here's just some of the process. It's usually taking a mold. Um, so I 3D printed this, um, the original tile, and then made a silicone mold of it. And then I take the piece and then painstakingly drop our little tiny pieces of color into it. Um, and you, or just fully forming the piece right here. And you can see, um, and this is all just a very specific type of concrete, um, layering it in and then filling in color, but that's mostly what I'm doing right now. So yeah, thank you. Kept it short and sweet for y'all. Great, thank you. Okay, um, so I'll just do a brief presentation on my work before we get into the, um, the moder the moderation or the um, the questions. Let's do that. Let's see. Great. Um, so as you all know, I'm the organizer of this show, um, and you know, part of the thinking of this show is that um, you know the whole kind of role or um, definition of being interdisciplinary. Um, you know, so there's so many parts in the process um, and really, you know, the audience really sees that last end result. Um, but in reality, you know, I've used so many different uh, types of techniques to get to the final object that you see. Um, so I was really interested, you know, in how that um, technology could be kind of, you know, is this sort of multifaceted tool um, I think someone else might have also discussed this as well, that has so many different sort of applications. Um, and, uh, you know, I think we just really see like 3D printing um, on the general kind of public knowledge is that, you know, you make little kind of characters um, or, you know, within pop culture, um, it might be more of a kind of like nerdy thing to do. Um, but really, you know, um, it, you know, expanding the kind of breadth and sort of depth of these kind of tools, um, I think is really, really important. And of course, having the kind of having the feminine voice within this kind of technology um, is extremely important as well, um, you know, just in the general public, but also for upcoming kind of emerging um, students that obviously most of our, us are educators. So, um, 
you know, just a really brief kind of rundown, you know, I started um, using CAD basically as a sketchbook for visualization um, to make basically very complicated forms. So um, it's a really great way to kind of draw things and build things, see how they are, and then basically collapse them back down into a drawing again, um, and then kind of start again. So um, instead of kind of like, you know, doing this huge project and seeing the end result, like right at the end, oh, and um, this just like really takes on um, kind of a lot more planning process that expedites um, that whole uh, kind of idea, ideation or thinking process. So um, this is more kind of recent work from the last sort of three years, um, basically making tiles when I was teaching in China because, you know, I didn't really have a lot of experience working with the clay. So making a lot of porcelain tiles that were basically high fired. So they all keep like fairly straight um, to their shape. Um, and then, you know, you can see they're on kind of shrink slabs, so obviously they won't warp and they um, kind of shrink um, in, like, you know, <laughs> as they shrink in the kiln, they get obviously smaller um, and they won't warp quite as much. Um, so basically taking these tiles, um, slotting together, them together and firing them at a kind of a low kind of glaze temperature. So I look at a lot of um, uh, architecture, both contemporary and kind of historic to um, kind of inform my work. Um, but basically the idea of, um, you know, making something that is usually kind of solid um, and opaque into something that is like quite wonderfully perforated um, and, you know, through this kind of technical process, um, creating something wonderful, really kind of trying to transforming it into something um, else. So, um, you know, this is just another kind of more recent piece. Obviously, before it was more kind of tiles that are slotted together, um, but now I'm kind of building more volumetric forms, um, which have like much more of a presence of kind of like a meat um, when you see it as well. Um, this is my piece at the center here. Um, so it's actually um, a piece which is uh, going to be kind of three panels. There's only one here. Um, later on, it will be an installation that's hanging from the ceiling that you could kind of walk into. Um, it was like a bit, bit more of a long-term project. I did have two students from UNT kind of helping me over kind of the last two years. Um, but, you know, a lot of my work is about how the two-dimensional basically becomes the three-dimensional in some sort of way um, and kind of having that experience of architecture, but um, within uh, a piece as well. So, um, yeah, but it's been <laughs> such like a great process working with all the artists in the show and also with uh, Dr. Ranieri. Um, so thank you for all your efforts. Um, and I think I'm not going to waste any more time. Actually, we're pretty good with time um, and hand it over to um, Dr. Ranieri. So. Thank you so much. Wow, I love hearing everyone speak about their work. Wonderful, thank you. I would love to touch on something that you just brought up, Eliza, and that Naomi had also mentioned before, which is both of y'all uh, alluded to the fact that you see technology as a craft tool. Craft tool was actually Naomi's terminology. And I would love to hear um, from some other panelists about how you see technology in your work? Is it a tool um, or in some cases, is it, is it more of the medium for you? Oh, anybody can feel free to jump in, so. Um, I'll jump in. I, I work very fluidly between uh, digital and analog and I don't think my process would be what it is like my whole practice wouldn't be what it is without um, designing especially because I get so nitpicky about how things look in space so I'll make giant um, rhino models of spaces so that I can see how it looks like you know, I mean, Lisa and them have seen this um, and to me it is very fluid and I do view it as both a tool um, I do view it as a tool first, but I do agree with Naomi about like, it's a craft tool and like that it, it, it really does elevate craft in a way and help us achieve stuff maybe that would be um, like planning and getting through work a lot faster and seeing how we can connect it and make it seem that the craft is not just this, um, this like very ancient thing. We, we do use it on the digital escape now. So I don't know, that's how I view it anyway. <laughs> I'll jump in too. I like this question. Um, I, I 
agree. I think of technology as a tool equivalent to like paintbrushes and those are technology. Um, but it, it is uh, clear, I feel like um, using digital fabrication tools has reconnected with, for me, in the identity of a craftsperson as well. Like it sort of empowered me both to build things that I probably maybe wouldn't do with other materials, but also to return to like some fiber practices. Um, it sort of is like the way that makes sense for my brain. And then it becomes part of the medium is like discovering the variations, the sort of like technical exploration of the tool. Um, I'm usually pretty motivated by doing something I've never done before, which is a whole other thing. <laughs> For me, technology was like tool, basically like tool. But I think when I use technology more and more, like make me so humble and then be patient and adapting all the situation because it looks really easy. Right, but actually, when you actually use the technology, ah, uh, super frustrating. And then, if you carving only one line, like on clay, maybe a few seconds. But actually, when you use the technology, it's take forever. Like one day, one week, who knows? So always like, oh my god, why am I using technology right now? So am I stupid or no? What, what are you? What am I doing? But I think it's worth it, you know. So like. So first time was two, but right now it's kind of like my life, you know, <laughs> it looks easy, but it's hard, always has like up, ups and downs. So right now, actually, I'm really enjoy to use technology, not just as tool. Yeah, it's interesting to think of it kind of as a craft tool, but um, also um, one thing is that it doesn't have a long history kind of behind it, which is really interesting because if you think about the wheel, I mean, it's been around for centuries, right? You know, there's so many things that are like made with the wheel. Um, so we have this kind of like um, idea in our head, oh, it's like a wheel turn pot. Like, oh, I know what that looks like. You know, someone on the road, <laughs> it's like, you know what that looks like, right? But when you say like, oh, I've like, you know, 3D printed or I've milled this or something like that, maybe someone doesn't know. So it's like, it's really exciting because, um, you know, I don't know when all this started, maybe like late eighties or whatever, but, um, you know, so we're actually starting to create that early kind of history um, of these tools, right? And these, um, and, and it's like, you know, um, I guess it, I don't know, I'm not a historian about this, but like maybe it kind of became accelerated because of the computer, obviously of the internet. Um, so it's really exciting that we don't necessarily, like we're kind of like making this history as we go. Um, kind of thing, and it's um, and it's no, it's always in tandem with something. At least like with us, it's like you know, well, um, like I print out this thing, but now I'm going to make a plaster mold of it, you know, and then I'm going to make a clay thing out of it. So it doesn't really exist on its own as an object. Um, in some ways, it's like there was always this kind of retranslation um, of that. But it's also interesting that you're taking this technology basically um, and using it to rethink kind of a historical process, like, you know, what if it is weaving or if it is mold making or something like that. Um, so it's really, um, you know, it's, it's helping to kind of push forward, but also rethink um, the whole kind of process. And with it, like there's a whole kind of aesthetic um, sort of style that, you know, is inherent with using that machine as well. I'm really interested in the way um, that um, Benjamin talked about the continuum of reproducibility, because I think when we talk about technology, we talk about it with specific lens towards digitality or electronics. Um, but I really resonated with what you said, Julie, about the history of technology is much more expansive um, and human invention of systems. Um, and that the advancement of like digitality and electronics doesn't negate the accomplishments of earlier systems. And so then you do have, and I think everyone in this room, room, um, <laughs> this room is an example of that, is um, engaging and reconciling in one way or another the, the um, 
the continued existence of these other systems with the introduction of new complexity and with new complexity, new opportunities for failure. And I think that's where I'm interested in seeing all of this as more than simply a tool that is utilitarian in nature, but view shaping a new materiality uh, a, a new way of inframing, sorry if you hate Heidegger, because the question concerning technology is the only way that I know how to think, <laughs> like inframe that. Um, but it is, it is um, in, a, in a, uh, strictable, and I feel like we're mostly exennials, probably of a similar generation, that I grew up without email and without a computer in the home, and then that change happened as I became of age. So I think that's also really interesting that we're this cohort grappling not only with that technological change, but um, changes um, in the way we as women negotiate that space because it is extremely, look at Silicon Valley, gaming culture, um, tech startups have been so um, exclusively um, male. So I think it's a really interesting question that you've put together, Elisa, thank you for that. Uh, Mary, do you want to jump in <laughs> before we move on or, you know, or I, Naomi? I took the words out of your mouth, Naomi, too. Uh, I, 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 for me, it's a tool um, and it's, it's a tool that uh, I can use to create in a, um, different layers of imagery of different perspectives of, of looking at things. Um, and it's, it's sometimes very complicated. Like Han was saying, you know, the animation is, um, very, um, very detail oriented and time consuming, but recently I've been throwing a lot of things on the scanner and scanning them, um, instead of using my camera. Yes. And so, um, that, that's like kind of a very fast way of jumping to an image that I'm, I'm interested in kind of pushing these things, um, more, more flat instead of as the depth that you were seeing in the video and the photograph. So, I mean, I think that's the great thing about I mean, we're, we're talking about very contemporary technology, but um, like Julie and Liz mentioned, everything, every, every tool that we're using is, is kind of a bit of tech, but that, but I think, I think I'm agreeing with a lot of people. Naomi? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I also wanted to mention too, like, you know, I do think of it as a craft tool, like because of my, um, the way that I'm using it, but I do agree that like, I think it has changed, shifted my perspective on technology in general and like things that I'm not comfortable with. I feel like as a ceramicist, I have had to adapt, you know, we deal with uh, um, casualties every day in the studio where things will break, things will, you know, have their own sort of, I don't know, they'll, they'll just have a mind of their own and you just have to adapt to the process. And I feel like with technology that's you know that's the same way where i i you know i've made my own shelves and pedestals before but like they've been very like boxy and so a lot of the things in my work i want to be soft i want to have them be approachable and with my change in perspective as far as like digital fabrication goes like i find it more approachable now because i feel like i'm using a three uh, I'm, I'm using a free program blender i'm using very simple um, shapes, and then I'm applying very simple modifiers to them, um, just like a wireframe modifier, triangulate, subdivision. I mean, things that like I'm I'm kind of thinking in the same way as like ceramics, where I'm layering, I coil build, I layer on modifiers. I um, it, this is a tool that um, is not making the work for me. It's making a layer of the work for me. Like it's, I'm, I'm programming it. I'm making the file. I'm saying, okay, this is the material I want to use. And then I have to do post-processing. And then I, you know, additionally layer on say like fiber or other kinds of materials. So, um, my experience is that like, I didn't find it approachable at first, but now um, I'm using it not only to reflect on my own personal experiences, but I also hope that other people find it a little bit more approachable to use because it is such a such a um, a tool with so many possibilities. 
Thank you. No, I loved what Elisa was alluding to about the wheel was also technology. <laughs> we look back several thousand years ago and we see the first kick wheels and then eventually with electricity, we see electric wheels. So what, um, what artists accept as being a, a tool that's worthy of their practice and I, I mean, I think that there's a lot of themes there within all of your work. So thank you so much. Those were awesome answers. Um, so Liz talked about the feminine in her video and applying the makeup, which is um, a traditionally a, a more feminine thing to do. But I see elements of the feminine in all of your works. And in some cases, I see that as kind of a reaction to something that maybe would be more masculine or feminizing something that's more masculine. So for example, Naomi, since you're still on the, the pinned <laughs> picture for me right now, um, the incorporation of knitting into your work, which is a traditionally female medium um, and something that women would do together, right? You, you talked about your knitting group um, in the, in, the history of textiles, we see that as being a primarily female thing to do. But also, uh, if I look at, for example, Julie's interest in the built environment, architecture and infrastructure and building are generally associated with the masculine. But you've taken those things and you've turned them into this kind of soft textile work, embroidery. Um, and so I find those kinds of dichotomies to be very, very interesting in all of the work um, specifically. So I don't know, Naomi, since you're up, would you maybe be interested in talking about how you view the feminine in your work or whether it's even important to you? Uh, sure, I mean, uh, I feel like um, as an artist who's a woman, I feel like it's going to come out somehow into my work. Um, uh, I But, I honestly, um, I wouldn't call my my focus uh, or my lens. I mean, it's it's going to be inherently feminine, but I I find that I prefer the term softness. Or uh, I like to I like kind of navigating to yeah softness because I'm I'm equating it with adaptability. Um, I feel like feminine is maybe too limiting, but it is something that I do identify with. Um, you know, I use, yeah, fiber. Um, I, I kind of, yeah, knitting is, I feel like in Western culture is more sort of um, attributed to, yeah, feminine, the feminine arts and things like that. But I love seeing the change of like the knitting community where there's, there's, people of all sorts who are knitting, but I'm also thinking of like, you know, knitting or, you know, maybe macrame. I'm thinking like, you know, fish, like creating like fish nets. Like, I mean, there's so many different ways of creating things with fiber um, that are maybe not feminine. So um, although I do navigate to things that I, you know, I'm attracted to like soft colors, bright colors, um, soft edges, things that could be considered feminine. I hope that I'm just expanding the, you know, the notion of um, these materials uh, and not necessarily saying, okay, this is a feminine object. Uh, of course, you could look at it with feminine qualities, but uh, that's my view on it. Um, I don't have an issue with it, but um, uh, I, you know, I think it's just like one of the many facets of my practice. Yeah, I, I wanted to just respond that um, I think um, the title ornament and adornment is really appropriate and um, right, like the, the history of women in visual arts will always have this question of like the feminine touch and um, like you know, I can't avoid it. And it's such a funny conversation when someone will say, oh, not that many women make work about driving cars. And I'm like, and they're in, you know, <laughs> the conversation, of, you know, but um, I do just think we're all really, what's interesting about the work in the show is pattern, 
like, you know, there's just this theme of patterning and uh, I wanted to sort of pick up with our previous conversation that for me, like um, these tools have empowered me to reconnect as like a learner. And I know I'm a teacher, so this is dorky, but like, I think of these tools as a way to like have more reflection about how I learn and I sort of give myself tasks to figure something out and so I've really connected reconnected with math <laughs> you know and like I mean it like in a way that I really didn't connect with math as a young learner I'm now like oh my god I get it now so <laughs> so I think that patterning is kind of like been feminized for a long time but I did want to mention that the first computer would have been a loom, you know, a, you know, a, a first binary code would be a punch card for a loom. So uh, I, that's sort of, I didn't really mention it, but the, our digital jacquard has been a, a sort of like battle that I'm, <laughs> I'm committed to <laughs> untangling. Mathematical one. Great. Um, so I think, uh, you know, those were, that was kind of a really good discussion. Um, so I think I might start kind of wrapping it up because it's exactly um, 1230 right now. Um, I don't know if anyone has any kind of final comments um, or if any of the students have any questions at all. I know it's been a long talk. Well, I actually had something to say that wasn't really a question, which was, oh. I love the way that all of you play with the idea of scale in your work whether it's something that feels like it should be big that's made little or something that feels like it should be small and that's made huge and in terms of just I think it's I think it is an excellent use of scale um, that all of you have incorporated into your works that was it it was a random thought that keeps coming oh, up. okay so no that's great thank you <laughs> Um, does anyone kind of want to respond to that as just kind of the last um, kind of comment of this talk at all? I'll do it. Um, yeah, actually, it's funny you mentioned that because most of the tiles that I'm referencing are literally like this tiny off a building. Like they're not, they're, they're detail, detail things. And I was like, I'm going to take this and blow it huge. <laughs> So yeah, scale is kind of funny, that intimacy, because you wouldn't notice it unless you were close to a building. Elizabeth, I think that's interesting that you mentioned that right off of the, the tail end of your previous question about the feminine, um, because I think that, so when I'm making my own work, I have, I have these tablescapes that aren't super big, but I might be blowing up the photographs very large. Um, and it's, it's something kind of toy-like and, and diminutive that's expanded upon. And I think a lot of times we have this association of the toy-like or the diminutive as also the domestic. Um, and, you know, during the, the ab-ex period um, in the United States for painting, we had these white male painters making paintings, you know, and they were these huge, hefty, meaty canvas things on, on the wall. And often women were not, um, were not uh, uh, seen as being able to participate in painting with a capital P, making these big things. And women made, you know, small things. Um, if they made art at all, they would often be relegated to craft. And that's a whole other, that, that art craft discussion, that's a whole other thing to put on the back burner. But I think that's interesting, Elizabeth, that you bring that up because I know in my work, and I think in a lot of, of, of people here were, were kind of, stepping in between those scale spaces. So we're like, you know, stepping into the space that has been seen so much as male, as making big pieces. I mean, we see in Elisa's work, for example, that that huge um, panel that's gonna be even bigger made of these very kind of small, intricate um, components. Um, and, and it's something that I'm, I'm also kind of playing with as well. From a photograph, I'm like pushing it into a painting. So I just, that's, I just love that observation because I think it connects so well to your previous question. 
And I also want to mention that it's inherent in the scanner space, right? If you make it anything larger than what you've put face down on it, it's sort of this miniature toy theater brought to, brought around through the specific, actually kind of almost outmoded technology. Um, so yeah, good point, Yuri. Great. Yeah, well, thank you for that, um, for these comments and for everyone uh, participating. Um, I just mentioned, might mention quickly before we kind of wrap up is that this show will be at uh, the GDAC, which is the Greater Denton Arts Council um, next fall. Um, I believe that is September 23rd to November 19th. I think I will double check those dates. However, um, you know, you will obviously get um, another chance to show the work that you've shown in this exhibition or a new work as well. Um, and definitely we will have another get together, which or talk hopefully in person, <laughs> which would be great. So um, we will get the opportunity to see each other again. So um, thank you and I'll wrap up and I will see you all again in person soon. So okay. thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks everyone. everyone. Thank you everyone. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> okay. Bye. Have a great day.